tonight, uh, Johnny Lawrence, who is completing his DPhil at Oxford on uh, 14th century anthologies uh, of the Cairo Sultanate. But tonight he's going to talk to us about William Jones and his library. And I think his interest in this, um, and you should have all received an article from the, from the journal which he, in which he wrote about on this subject, uh, stemmed from his work that he did uh, on the Jones project at the British Library. So Johnny, I'm going to hand over to you now and you'll screen share. And I look forward to, I think what promises to be a really very interesting um, talk. So thank you. Thank you, um, Alison. That's a very kind introduction. Um, just before I begin my talk, I wanted to say a couple of thanks. Firstly, to Charlotte, um, Alison and Matty at the Royal Asiatic Society for hosting me tonight, very kindly inviting me. Um, also to my supervisor, Julia Bray, whose academic support has allowed me to grow in ways I did not think was possible a few years ago. To the British Library APAC team, and in particular Ursula Sims Williams, who generously mentored my doctoral placement at the British Library and provided me with lots of help in researching the manuscript collection. I would also like to throw out a personal note of thanks to my colleague and friend Fuchsia Hart, who has lent an eye to the odd bit of hard to read script in the Jones collection and provided this literature scholar with a much needed art historical perspective. So, let's begin. Often hailed as a polymath or polyglot, Jones, William Jones, is one of the most fascinating of the early colonizers in India where he established the Asiatic Society in Kolkata in 1784, a forerunner but not parent of the Royal Asiatic Society, who is of course generously hosting this evening's lecture. Early members of this Asiatic Society included other colonizers like Francis Gladwin, Alexander Hamilton and Charles Wilkins, who each, like Jones, translated a wealth of knowledge from Persian, Sanskrit and Arabic and other languages into English. I imagine that many or most of those in the audience tonight have at least some awareness of Sir William Jones, who died in Bengal in 1794. And I do not mean to hagiographically retell his life story, for that has been done many times before. But for those in the audience with very little background information on Jones, I will provide a potted biography. He was born in London in 1746, uh, and his father died three years later. His mother raised him and then sent him off to Harrow for school. Having studiously picked up Latin, French, Greek, and other European languages at Harrow, Jones took up the private study of Hebrew and Arabic before attending University College at the University of Oxford, where he also added Persian to the list. Jones brought a man called Mirza to Oxford to help him advance in his studies of Arabic, a move which Garland Cannon, one of Jones's biographers, suggests nearly bankrupted him. This Mirza is somewhat of a historical unknown. Supposedly a native of Aleppo, the term Mirza is actually Persian, coming from Amir Zadeh, or child of the Emir, often used as an honorific title to signify a lineage connected to various royal dynasties. It is confusing, but not impossible that an Aleppan would have this name. Given that we have absolutely no other historical information regarding this man, indicative of Jones's treatment of his Arabic, Persian and Indian interlocutors more broadly, uh, a theme I will return to later in this talk, it is hard to say who he is, how he ended up in England, or what kind of background he came from. In any case, Jones studied the 1001 nights with um, this Mirza, Incidentally, given the subject of the talk, Jones's manuscript copy of the Knights, presumably the one that Mirza copied out for him, is now lost. He continued his studies at Oxford for a number of years, acquiring a fellowship from University College in the process. Across the 1760s, he acquired a name for himself among fellow Orientalist scholars like the Hungarian Count Karoli Ravishki, or his fellow student at Oxford, the Dutch Hendrik Albert Schultens, the son and grandson of the two chair of two chairs of Oriental languages at Leiden University, a post that uh, he would later take up himself. As evidenced in his letters, Jones was a keen correspondent with both men and others, with whom he would frequently share insights on matters literary, read drafts and proofs and comment on publications, much like any graduate student or academic does for their friends now. Coincidentally, and a bit sadly, all three men died within 12 months of each other. 
Throughout this period, in which Jones applied himself predominantly to literary and linguistic scholarship before joining the Middle Temple, he was also the tutor to the future Viscount Althorpe, who would become the second Earl Spencer. This position, combined with Jones's modest fellowship, helped cover the costs of his student life at Oxford and provide for his family. By the end of the 1760s, yeah. By the end of the 1760s, Jones had acquired such a name for himself that the Danish ambassador to London asked him to translate the Tari Khinaliri, the history of the reign of Nadir Shah. This particular incident has caused quite a lot of comment from Jones's various biographers, who note that Jones, a classical liberal, was disdainful of Nadir Shah, whom Jones considered somewhat of a tyrant. Here, I would argue we can see a clear influence from the contemporary Orientalist trope of the despot, which worked to minimize the very real tyranny, pillage and plunder committed by the emerging Europe, uh, East India Company actions in India by maximizing the Persian Shah's commitment of the same sorts of actions. In any case, the translation into French was accomplished and printed in 1769. He went on to publish Un Traité sur la Poésie Orientale, in which he argues, like several other 18th century poets and authors, that Arabic and Persian poetry might be utilized to rejuvenate European poetry and literature. And that's uh, uh, the term I quote from Canon. During the 1770s, he was on somewhat of a publishing role, translating the Mu'allaqat, or the seven pre-Islamic hanging odes, that according to legend, were hung around the Kaaba into English for the first time. He also produced in this period a grammar of Persian, the Dissertation sur la littérature orientale, and his poems consisting chiefly of translations from the Asiatic languages, this latter text stretching the terms translation and chiefly beyond all recognisable bounds of meaning. In 1774, Jones was admitted to the bar, and from then on, Jones's legal and political careers took off, and he wrote and published several pamphlets and legal tracts. It was also in this period that he cast his eyes on acquiring a potential role abroad, at first unsuccessfully seeking to become the ambassador to Istanbul. Towards the end of the 1770s and in the early portion of the 1780s, having failed to become member of parliament for Oxford University, he began to aspire to the vacant judgeship which had opened up at Fort William in Bengal. As he wrote in a 1782 letter to Edmund Burke, at the time the MP for Malton, Jones states that he had hoped for this position not only because of the lucrative financial benefits taking up a position in the East India Company's colonial bureaucracy represented, but also because he might spend his savings acquiring books in Arabic and Persian and in rewarding and translating, sorry, in rewarding the translators and interpreters of them, his words. Following in the footsteps of a man he greatly admired, Edward Pocock, whose manuscripts Jones had diligently studied at, during his time at university, Jones intended to amass a set of manuscripts and return with them from India to Oxford, where they might be housed for future scholarship. Here, for example, on British Library Manuscript RSPA 106, Jones notes that he has had his scribe copy one of Pocock's manuscripts, tying himself, so this is a Hamasa, one of Abu Tamam, a copy of Abu Tamam's Hamasa, by the way, tying himself into a chain of scholarship that stretches back to the, Lord, the very first Laudian professor. Um, and you can see Pocock's name here if my uh, cursor is showing up, which I hope it is. He was eventually rewarded with the position on the High Court at Fort William and arrived in Kolkata, which is about here, uh, in 1784, where he resided, taking occasional trips up to Krishnanagar, about um, just slightly north of there, to escape the heat and crowding of the city. In India, he learned Sanskrit thanks to the aid of a man called Ramalochana. Uh, and amassed a fairly large collection of uh, Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit manuscripts, with a few Chinese, Malay, and Urdu texts as well. His wife, ill more or less the entirety of their stay in India, returned to England in 1793. Jones began preparations to return to London and sent his manuscript collection to the Royal Society, instructing Joseph, Sir Joseph Banks to make them available to anyone with a scholarly interest. Presumably, Jones was planning to withdraw the manuscripts and make good on his previous promise that he would bequeath them to the University of Oxford. Unfortunately for him, however, Jones died from an inflamed liver in April 1794 before he could return to England. <laughs> 
and so the manuscripts remained at the Royal Society Library before being transferred to the India Office Library in 1876, which was later subsumed by the British Library, where they now reside. For those keen students of Arabic and Persian book culture and history who might be unfamiliar with the British Library's ordering system, you can request Jones's manuscripts today. And they can be found through the British Library's Request Other Items tab, which is available on the Explore function. You then click on the APAC Collections tab and type in the shelf mark RSPA, followed by the manuscript number as found in Denison Ross and Brown's 1902 catalogue, which is reprinted more or less as Appendix 1 in my own article that you received yesterday. Some of the manuscripts are currently accessible through the explore function, but given the coronavirus pandemic and the difficulties that's placed on all library work, this, has not, um, this is not possible for all of the manuscripts. As for Jones's Sanskrit manuscripts, these are also accessible via the same route, but under RST, followed by the number of the manuscript in Tawney and Thomas's 1902 catalogue, which again is reprinted as Appendix 2 in a slightly different order. Aside from this group of manuscripts, however, Jones also retained about 40 manuscripts in various European languages, as well as Persian, Arabic and Sanskrit, and an enormous European language printed book collection, which was then sold at auction following his wife Anna Maria's death in 1831. The auction catalogue can now be found through Google Books, but the original ledger is actually at the Royal Asiatic Society Library. And were this talk in person, I'm sure I'd have delighted in saying here at the Royal Asiatic Society Library, but alas. These manuscripts were brought by, uh, from Jones by a motley crew of different collectors and people in the book trade. Many ended up in the hands of Nathaniel Bland, whose manuscript collection represents a considerable portion of the John Ryland's library's Arabic and Persian collections. Some of these manuscripts are now lost, like the Knight's manuscript I mentioned earlier, or um, their whereabouts or connection to Jones unknown, like the rather intriguing Sumatran Bata manuscript on Bark, gifted to Jones by Sir Francis Light, the founder of the colony of Penang. I have given this talk the title Acquiring Books in 18th Century Bengal, Sir William Jones's Library, as if Jones hadn't already acquired a relatively large number of Arabic and Persian manuscripts before embarking for India. These manuscripts, now spread across the John Rylands Library, the Bodleian Library and the British Library, provide a fascinating testament to Jones as student of Arabic and Persian literature in England in the 1700s. One of them, a copy of El Mutanabbi's Diwan, as you can see on the screen in front of you, was a gift from an Abdurrahman Beg, presumably some notable from Hama, based on various notes in the manuscript, who was an acquaintance of Edward Wortley Montague, himself a distant acquaintance of Jones. Jones also received a copy of Farhangi Jahangiri from Irtasam ad a well-known munshi at the time in the service of General John Karnak. Even more interesting than these gifts, Jones was also a copyist, laboriously scribing a number of texts that he wanted a personal copy of. In my estimation, the most interesting of these is John Ryland's Arabic 2645 Mingana 945, this is ostensibly a copy of Ibn Abi Hajala's Sukadana Sultan, a largely unstudied and bizarrely constructed text of Egyptian history written in the period of the Cairo Sultanate. So far, the only dedicated study of Sukadana Sultan has been conducted by Beatrice Brundler, although James White has also published on similar 18th century English scholars as Jones, who also owned copies of the Sukadan, which was presumably a rather fashionable text at the time. This manuscript is not just a copy of the Sukadan, however, but also, as you can see, includes a vast cornucopia of material waiting to be studied, including Jones's aid memoir entitled Keys of the Chinese Language, a selection of extracts from the Hikal Padesha, and some short Robert in Persian, among other bits of text. The inclusion of the Hitol Padesha tells us Jones took the manuscript to India, where he learned Sanskrit. However, as I am sure you can see, the manuscript is crying out for a more detailed codicological study than the limited comments I've made tonight, which I am certain would provide a very rich picture of Jones, the scholar, reader, collector and translator. Now, let us turn in what remains of this lecture to Jones in India and Jones using his manuscripts. In the article you received, I walk the reader through the various processes through which Jones acquired or collected his manuscripts. 
in this talk, I would like to reflect more keenly, not on the physical means by which he did so, but what those means and the traces he left on the manuscripts that refer to those means can tell us about Jones's conception of self as manuscript collector and as scholar in 18th century Bengal. Before going any further, I would like to pause at the image I chose for this evening's lecture. I did not choose this image, which hangs in the print room off the Asian and African reading room at the British Library by accident. Taking a closer look at the portrait painted by Arthur William Devis during his stay in Bengal, we get a sense of how Jones wanted to style himself. In the background, the building fits a fairly standard European portraiture motif of the late Georgian period, with the column and curtain a favourite background in images of George III, then monarch, and his son George IV, for example. In the foreground, Jones in full European dress, and I think it's sort of legal dress, but I'm not sure, stands with his hands masterfully poised on an open book with a statue of the Hindu deity Ganesh behind him in the background. The placing of Ganesh on the desk is interesting. It connects the books, the table and writing material, so central to Jones's career as scholar and lawyer with the iconography of the world around him in India. Ganesh, on the table surrounded by books, becomes the very embodiment of the Orientalist appropriation of Indian and other cultures as objects of study. We can imagine Jones writing a description of the statue in front of him or using the statue to improve his understanding of Indian religio-cultural practices. But what is crucial is that Ganesh is the only image which might point to India at all. By this, I mean that the image constructs Jones as the archetypal European, moving to India and collecting items, be they textual or material, for study. The context of those items is then whitewashed, represented with a European background, divorced from their contexts. This, I would argue, is emblematic of some of the ways in which Jones treated manuscript acquisition, both in terms of the actual methods of acquiring texts and how he worked with those texts once acquired. I began working with Jones's manuscript collection during my doctoral internship at the British Library in the few fleeting months of 2020 before the country locked down. I set about cataloguing the Jones collection and in so doing, I tweeted and Instagrammed and otherwise shared a number of images of Jones's manuscripts, either of as, as advertisements for blogs or to promote the project. I remember well when either I or the British Library Asian and African Twitter handle, tweeted a series of pictures like the one on your screen now, uh, which showed Jones writing his name rather pointedly just before the text on the manuscript's first folio. Usually, although not always, Jones would scratch his name in thin black ink directly onto the gold box decoration in the text's headpiece, to use Gatchek's English term for what you might know as the Sarlo or Onvan, as you can see here, and here. Upon tweeting these images out to the Twitter sphere, I was struck by the intensity of the reaction of many colleagues, objecting to what they saw as the desecration of manuscripts by a foreign hand. I had by that time grown so used to seeing Jones's scribbles all over manuscripts that I had in some ways stopped noticing these moments in which he very literally signs his name onto the manuscript text. But it is in this simple signing of the name that um, and in the choice of where to sign specifically, the permanence with which he makes his signature, that we can see how Jones's conception of self as manuscript co collector emerged most clearly. Now, looking at Jones signing his name in the gold piling of the manuscript, or in the headpiece of the manuscript, and I'm going to move to this image because it's slightly clearer, you can see it here, um, the literal imposition of a name into the headpiece stakes a claim of permanence on the manuscript. The manuscript becomes indelibly tied in a very obvious way to W. Jones. Usual Arabic, Persian, Indian practice, of course, is through seals or ownership statements, which tend to cluster, although not always, and sometimes they're found dotted throughout a manuscript, on either the first folio before the text block or on the final folio after the text block. That is not to say that such custom is never broken by those uh, Arabic, Persian, Indian or, whatever, or beyond readers. As you can see on the screen now, a different manuscript from Jones's collection, his copy of a portion of El Mas'udi's Muruj al Dhahab, has a previous reader here um, write all over a part of the Onvan. However, signing one's name into the gold cartouche into the text block itself presents us with a different image. We might be tempted to turn to Sarah Ahmed's work on use here 
and think about how objects can tell certain stories through the way they have been used, the object's biography. The cartouche or headpiece is not intended for someone to sign one's name. That it can be used for this purpose makes the use unusual and worthy of comment. To me, and this is conjecture of course, the cartouche is shaped as a little box above the block of text in such a way as I can almost imagine myself and Jones thinking that the block ought to be used for one's name. But in using the manuscript in this way, the manuscript becomes less receptive to future users. After all, there is only room for one name in the tile. In this way, the name stakes some sort of permanence and ownership, making the manuscript cling to Jones in a way that future users cannot restake a claim of ownership on the manuscript in the same fashion. And if we think about the fact that Jones was always acquiring these manuscripts for a library, which is something that will come up a couple of times in this lecture, there was never any doubt on the fact that this was going to stay a Jones manuscript in his mind. And indeed, were I to acquire this manuscript tomorrow, which I think would be unethical in the extreme, and scribble signatures all over it, the signature would not stop making a claim on the manuscript as Jones's, a claim which spatially is so integrated into the text of the manuscript, with his name placed immediately above the text, framed in a box of gold, central to the manuscript's reading. The claim staked of permanent ownership, which I've just said, is only half the story and a bit of a misnomer. Jones is not staking a claim on the manuscripts as the end user, just as the previous user of Maruja the Hub did not. Indeed, I think Jones hoped that there would never be such a thing as an end user, but that the manuscripts would continue to be useful too. And I quote from his letter to Sir Joseph Banks, any studious men who may apply to them. In other words, Jones has an eye to posterity. What I mean is that Jones always envisioned himself as being remembered, just like Pocock was, as someone who brought manuscripts back for a Jones library. After all, he did set out with this intention, naming the desire explicitly in his letter to Burke. Of course, he is not alone in doing so. Uh, there are many such collectors, like the Bland collection I met, collection, sorry, like the Bland collection I mentioned earlier, or other collections um, dotted around the country and around Europe. And I would wager that many other early collectors, and there were many early collectors, also inscribed themselves obviously into unusual places in the manuscripts they collected. I must emphasize this before people claim I'm giving him a rough ride and saying he is going about desecrating manuscripts, something which I do not think, as in my personal opinion, there is no moral value to be placed on different types of usage mark. Such moral value judgments tend to reflect more, I think, on contemporary concern for manuscripts as art historical objects of wonder and beauty, rather than as the everyday tools of a reader in a reader culture which does not include the regular printing of books. Of course, some manuscripts, such as uh, the one on the screen in front of you actually, or um, various others within the Jones collection are rather more beautiful than others. And I am well aware that not all manuscripts were intended to be used as such everyday tools of reading. Although of course the intention of use does not dictate the way that the manuscript is used. My comments regarding manuscript use and the distortion of context through use are instead intended to remind us that any scholarship that Jones and others undertook was not paperless. Rather, the study of the Orient, his term, was always dependent on the material resources that scholars like Jones had to hand. Through concentrating on the physical remnants of their scholarship in the very, in the very manuscript text that we have to hand uh, in libraries today, we can actually get behind the myths of individual scholars in their field building endeavours and begin to understand the kinds of intellectual traditions they were participating in. Someone else had owned this book before. There are other um, annotations all over it as well. Jones is reading with other readers. There are other indications of Jones building a library for future scholarship, including his own future scholarship across the manuscripts, which might help expand our lens here a bit and show us how Jones thought about his place in an object's biography. One thing to note here is that when I say building a library and talk about the future both as his and as the future of other users, I do not suggest that Jones was investing in present, invested in presenting a pristine, unblemished collection of manuscripts to the end user. Rather, I would propose that his annotations show his desire for scholarly dialogue across time with the presumed future users. This might be himself, it could serve as an aid memoir, I mean that kind of works in the same way, but it was also clearly for other users of manuscripts. And one thing also to note is that this is not a general rule covering all annotations. 
there are many annotations on the Jones collection, particularly uh, clustered around his legal works, which show him using the books, not as scrap paper so much as almost like a textbook, him working out different sums and different um, types of inheritance claim uh, on the paper of the manuscript itself. Now, uh, again, I apologize for the kind of small image um, and my hand in the middle of it. Looking at this image, for example, we can see how Jones places himself and his scholarship into the physical manuscript for the benefit of the future user as a moment of scholarship in and of itself. This is Jones's copy of Ghulam Hossein Tabatabai's Siyar al Mutaakhirin, a well known history of India written in Persian charting the period from Aurangzeb's reign to 1781, just before Jones arrived in India. Indeed, there is every possibility that Jones met Ghulam Hossein, who was uh, at the time when Jones arrived, um, staying with Ali Ibrahim Khan, an acquaintance of Jones, who I'll come on to later, whom he met several times and noted this in his private notebooks. In the manuscript today, there is, and you can't see it on the screen, but there is a short letter to Jones from Francis Gladwin, a fellow Persianist and member of the Asiatic Society, which is appended and notes that the first half of the text uh, the Muqaddima was uh, copied verbatim from the Ma'asiri Alamgiri, uh, a different text of um, uh, Indian history. On the physical manuscript itself, Jones records Gladwin's observations for the future reader, and this is the note you can see here, which also notes that it's a gift. Uh, the note works to safeguard the intellectual property of Muhammad Saqi Musta'id Khan, the author of the Ma'asir, whose work, according to Gladwin, has been cribbed. No future reader should assume that this first part was authored by Ghulam Hussein Tabatabai then, but rather be aware of the mixed contents of the manuscript. This sort of note, of course, is predicated on uh, an assumption about text and historiography that is alien to the writing culture in which the texts were created, but that is a story for another day. Back to Jones. This is not the only example. Noting on one of his copies of Farhangi Jahangiri, not by the way the aforementioned copy given to him by Ertis Ahmed Dean, that there are many corrections to this valuable work in two works, the Siraj al lughat by Siraj al Dean Arzu and the Majma al lughat Jones makes comments upon the quality of the text in, inside the manuscript. I will leave you to wonder the value Jones ascribes to this lexicon, which he describes as requiring many corrections. But it does point, however, to Jones looking at the manuscript with an eye for the future and a philological eye. His desire for the future reader not to accept the contents of the text as blank, unproblematic information. Rather, this is a moment of Jones's scholarship. He is holding the hand of the reader to some extent, reminding them that the dictionary may itself mislead, that the student will have to seek out knowledge from other sources to supplement and complement the material in the text. In both of these notes, and in many other similar types of note uh, across his collection, Jones is very specific about how a future reader ought to interact with the material. The traces of his use, his annotations, ideas, notes, and name tags serve to inform the future reader, and in doing so, shape the way the reader interacts with the text. The use of the manual script then imprints Jones into the reading of the text, in that his framework, his reading, becomes that within which the future reader works. This is what I mean when I say Jones is engaging with future scholarship through a performative note making, and in many ways makes the manuscript cling to him, just like signing his name had. Acknowledging, once again, that his stated intention all along was for these manuscripts to be housed in the Bodleian or the Royal Society Library, Jones is always aware that his intrusions into the manuscript do not end with him, but rather are visible for future readers. And this is most evident, I think, in his Sanskrit manuscript collection, in which almost every single manuscript includes a title page of varying detail, specifying the manuscript's contents for the future user and librarian. And it's this sort of note that we have here, title page and uh, discussion of the contents that we tend to see in, this, in the Sanskrit manuscripts, much more than in the Persian and Arabic ones. But what sorts of scholarship from his own time does Jones acknowledge? <laughs> The sort of note that Jones most interested that most interested me in the Jones collection when I was going through this collection was his practice of noting who he acquired his manuscripts from and when. There are a number of short notes in his manuscripts that tell us when and where he acquired manuscripts from a group of acquaintances, and you can see these in the table on the screen. There is a regularity to these notes, 
often Jones will say uh, the day or the year of manuscript, of manuscript acquisition and who the donator was, occasionally saying where it was donated or when he read it. He also frequently notes when he lends his books out to friends and acquaintances. This, like his note about Gladwin's observations, which is one of many such notes that Gladwin and others provided Jones about his, uh, about his collections, highlights his desire to situate his scholarship in a European network of collection and academic work. However, there is a very obvious group of scholars with whom Jones worked extensively and on whom both the acquisition or production of the majority of his manuscript collection and his comprehension of the contents and their contexts, as well as the sorts of intertexts the books were referencing, relied, local scholars. Incidentally, where I talk about context and intertext, I would like to take the moment to remind myself and everybody in the audience that Jones, hailing from Britain in the 1700s, did not have tools like the Encyclopedia of Islam or Encyclopedia Iranica or any wealth of scholarship on Arabic, Persian or Sanskrit literature and had only a very limited access to texts. In the remainder of this talk, I will turn my focus to the ways in which he works through his manuscripts and public facing scholarship to obscure his dependence on local contacts. These scholars have then been written out of the construction of our field, with the myth being Jones as paperless scholar ex nihilo, whose insights came from a personal study, not as the tangible product of many different scholarly networks and physical manuscripts, which relied on a considerable, considerable amount of unacknowledged labor. Very, very rarely does Jones mention outside of his private notebooks that he had any help from local scholars in sourcing books. In his letters to other Europeans, we only find the faintest of traces of specific figures like his scribe Haji Abdullah or the chief magistrate of Waransi, himself an exceptionally important Indian scholar of the 18th century, the aforementioned Ali Ibrahim Khan. Nowhere does he mention the many different colleagues with whom he regularly conversed about books, where to acquire them, which to get, what they said, what they were referencing. Figures like Abdul Majid, Abdul Rahim, Haji Ghulam Ali, all of whom offered to buy Jones books on their way to or from pilgrimages remain complete unknowns. Did they? I don't know. There are books in the Jones collection which appear to have traveled from as far afield as Egypt and Yemen. Were these brought back by these men? We will never know because unlike his modus operandi when it comes to receiving books from European scholarship, from European acquaintances, Jones never tells us. One of the most glaring uh, omissions of this variety concerns a man called Sayyid Azhar Ali Khan, whose seal you can see on the screen in front of you. Jones refers to him once in his letters as his Persian Munshi, not by name. He was the son of Nadir Shah's doctor, who came to India during the former's invasion of the Mughal Empire in 1738 to 1740. Presumably, the doctor stayed. Why this omission is so glaring is the preponderant role that Azhar Ali Khan clearly played in guiding Jones's intellectual journey. The work put in is not reflected by Jones's citation practice, to borrow the terms of modern scholarship. I first began to be interested by this man when I realized that his seal was present on six of Jones's manuscript holdings, by far the most common seal in the collection. I assumed that either Jones had acquired the entire collection together because of the dates on the seal, perhaps through an auction, or that he knew Azhar Ali Khan personally and acquired them directly from him. It was only through using his private notebooks where he jotted down the different meetings he had with various men and the names of acquaintances, as well as their occupations or specialisms, presumably to help him remember who all the different people he came into contact with were, that I could work out who this was. In the notebook, Jones returns again and again to the name, saying he set up meetings for him with eminent intellectuals, or gave him books, or bought books on his behalf, or brought him books from his private collection, or recommended that Jones take a look at other books. It was only when he once noted the factoid in the notebook about his father that I could put down, put together the uh, identity with the contact. Thinking about Jones's intellectual context, without the work of Azhar Ali Khan or the other men I just mentioned, Jones did not have access to books at all, and crucially to the conversations which helped him understand those books or pass the information he was reading. Despite the mytholo mythological status of his figure, Jones did not just sit about all day reading texts and absorbing information. He had a day job as well. 
Rather, his insights and understanding of Islamic law, Arabic poetry, Persian poetry, the vocabularies of both languages, their grammars and beyond, were constantly being constructed in dialogue with his circle of local acquaintances, and his ability to access knowledge was always conditioned upon these acquaintances. One of my favourite notes in the entire collection is where Jones says that his contact Ahmad has seen a number, which is a sort of mysterious mononym which pops up a couple of times, has seen a number of manuscripts that Jones wants to acquire in Lucknow. What the note reminds us is not only that A, in order to possess a book or to access its knowledge in a more ephemeral way, the manuscript had to exist in the first place, but B, Jones had to know it existed, C, that manuscripts whereabouts had to be found, and D, he had to be able to get there. Another man who gets a fairly rough ride in Jones's notes and letters is his Arabic scribe, Haji Abdullah, who I have mentioned a few times. Haji Abdullah was a very important contact for Jones and personally contributed 11 manuscripts to Jones's 119 Arabic and Persian manuscripts, all of which uh, he scribed for Jones. In his colophons, an example of which you can see here, he gives some details about his life. He had completed the Hajj at least twice, resided for some of his life between Mecca and Medina, and was a scholar using both Persian and Arabic. It appears that his father may also have been a scholar, but it's not clear. In every single colophon that Haji Abdullah writes, he writes fulsome and lavish praise for Jones, his employer, noting his position on the high court, referring to him with a string of superlative adjectives. By contrast, Jones only makes two mentions of him in public facing writing, i.e. not in his notebook. The first, in a little manuscript note, shows Jones calling him a boy that he got to pen the work. In the second, in a letter, Jones calls this erudite scribe a wild little native of the Arabian Peninsula. I don't think I need to insult your intelligence by going on about my point here. This man who was so crucial to Jones's intellectual formation, who was a frequent conversation partner, according to the notebooks, a man without whom Jones did not have access to a great number of texts in Arabic, is simply written out of the narrative, infantilized and turned into a wild little native, a man on whom Jones does not recognize his scholarship depending. You might wonder why this matters now and why I have spent so much time poring over what the traces of use on Jones's physical manuscripts can tell us about how he worked as a scholar, how he saw the objects of his study as his materials and the kinds of knowledge he lifted up as opposed to those he ignored, brushed aside or took advantage of. With growing calls across academia to decolonize university education, knowledge production, and the ways in which we research, we must think seriously about what such decolonization might look like and how we might apply it in our own fields. I can think of worse things to do than to reckon with the foundations of the field, with figures like Jones, who were at one and the same time colonizers and scholars. Jones has often been somewhat hailed as a hero of humanities academia. There have been a great number of hagiographic biographies which tell the story of how this man from supposedly middle-class origins rose to become an unsurpassed scholar. His mastery of a great number of languages and his prodigious publications in his short life, publications which remain useful sources of information to us now, have given him the dubious honor of being a role model to many scholars over the, the uh, past 200 years, who see in Jones a model of cross-disciplinary scholarship with his academic work bringing the cultural product of Asia to European audiences for their consumption, as if that exposure or consumption is inherently beneficial or important to the cultural product. Jones is cast in this reading as a somewhat sympathetic figure, a man enamoured with the Orient, as he termed it, whose affective identification and empathetic compassion for the objects of his study, the wine evoked by Harfez, the landscapes in the Mu'al Laqat, the theatrics of Kalidasa, an affective identification which does not stretch to the wild little natives of the lands from which they came, somehow makes up for the colonial project inherent within his life and scholarship, something which, by the way, has barely been touched on in modern academic publications on Jones at all. Turning back to the focus of this lecture, Jones's books, we have seen how this image of the polymath scholar expeditioner is only a very partial image of the man and his work, and the veneration of this image both buys into Jones's own self-mythologization and the colonial orientalizing epistemologies which produced it. <laughs> 
In particular, let us reflect on the way Jones skates over the dozens of local informants and contacts who shaped his knowledge and publications, and who are now only visible to us in hidden archives, private notebooks, seal records, purchase notes, joining up the dots. When we bring these names to the surface, the image of Jones as scholar ex nihilo begins to crumble. He may have had great affective identification with the textual study of Arabic, Persian and Sanskrit, but should his treatment of Arabs, Persians and Indians be ignored when we appreciate the ways in which his knowledge is constructed? In calling Haji Abdullah a wild little native, we can see summed up very succinctly the contradiction at the heart of Jones's scholarship and scholarship on Jones. His failure to cite his interlocutors, his presumption of the knowledge that they provide, and even the very physical material realities of the texts they provide for him, and his disregard for them, writing them out of the story, allows him to be constructed by us and by him as a kind of father of this field, one of its progenitors, or as the master scholar who brought literature in Arabic, Persian, Sanskrit, and beyond to academic study. This expropriation of knowledge is dependent on an inherent colonial logic, a logic which sees the peoples of the Orient, the texts they produced, the services they rendered, as inherently unimportant. I am not calling, and I can't stress this enough, I am not calling for us to ignore the vast contributions that Jones uh, made to scholarship, or for us to write him up as some evil colonizer. Rather, I am calling for us to contextualize him, to normalize him, and to get to the man behind the myth and to remember that in a logic which sees knowledge as something waiting to be discovered and brought back, modern emulation and veneration of Jones in academic scholarship is likewise predicated on silencing and erasing the contexts out of which that knowledge comes, just like Ganesh sat on Jones's table. And I thank you very much for listening to me talk for about 45 minutes, so um, I look forward to questions, and um, here's my contact details if you would like to get in touch. Shall I stop sharing my screen, Alison? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Johnny. Now, uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. That was an excellent, very thought-provoking lecture. Um, and um, if you would like to um, make questions or put questions for Johnny, perhaps you could use the chat uh, and type them um, at the bottom of the, your screen. You can see them there, see it there. Um, Right, let's just see if I'm just waiting now. Well, um, the, all right, I, I, I will uh, put a question to you as we're, as we're waiting. And um, I, I think it's very interesting, the points that you raised about uh, all, um, you know, where his omissions, if you like, um, of, of his sources, and I think that's a, that's a very important point because there was sort of, as you say, this jump and this gap. Um, I was just wondering, in his diaries and uh, um, letters, does he, I mean, he doesn't mention his uh, relationships, you know, academic relationships, but does he make any other references to the to his munchies and the relationship or how often he met with them etc so not regularly um but occasionally you will find mentions of um jones particularly talking to haji abdullah and um his persian munchi who i i worked out to be Azhar ali khan what we um tend to see in the letters and the, and the um, scholarly apparatus together is the he he tends to write um, about pan, pandits and maulvis in a rather disparaging tone as this kind of group of people who are preventing him from getting on with the daily business of running the court in Fort William. The other person who he does talk about at length is um, Ali Ibrahim Khan who he had a great veneration for and of all the various scholars uh, of the uh, who were resident in India, Ali Ibrahim Khan is the one that he mentions the most and has the most respect for by far. Uh, but I suppose that my comments refer mostly to um, the fact that they tend to be unnamed. They tend to become these kind of helpless, useless people in his life. But in the notebook, in the private notebook, they're very important, quite distinguished scholars, some of whom ended up writing books that were in his collection, which we don't find anywhere else. It's because I was just thinking, uh, I mean, when you were saying all the nice things that they, they, they said about him in, 
kind of one. That, he was that clearly friends with these guys. That's why you want to see more of it. Yes, I thought that they must have had a warm relation, mm. you know, in in reality. Although he, yeah. he you know, fails to acknowledge that. So behind that, that, there must have been a relationship to for him to sort of, you know, garner all this knowledge from them and to go forward. Right. Yeah. We have, um, we have an, a question here. Um, I just uh, um, right. Uh, oh, this is a comment. I think this is from Julia Bray. Uh, she says Jones's memorial stone calls him the lawgiver of the Hindus. So I don't know if you want to. <laughs> uh, actually, there is a very interesting um, comment to be made on that, and it's. I'm just going to reference um, a really, really, really formative um, paper that I read that was really useful in shaping my thoughts about the collection, which is Gillian Everson's um, by uh, discu discussion of a collection of sh um, Sanskrit manuscripts that are uh, housed at the Bodleian, and. Um, they in that article she talks at length about how many of jones's attitudes which are evident in his uh, creation of text or his use of text about hindu law and as the hindu lawgiver um stem from his kind of misunderstanding of the bases on which hindu law was founded um so i'm you know, i'm just completely parroting uh Professor Everson on this one, but um, his his different epistemology and his different outlook on what law means, where it can be free flowing and open, uh, in in comparison to a kind of English rule book and statute. So uh, yeah, there's an interesting thing to be said, I'm sure, about him being the rule giver of the Hindus. Right. Now um, we've got we've got a few more. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about his Sanskrit manuscripts? Um, are they on paper or palm leaf? Were they made um, for him or bought? And if bought, where were they from? And are there any particularly that are, that are particularly rare? Um, unfortunately for you in the audience, I'm not actually I'm I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, and I don't I don't know um, Sanskrit at all. I have looked at the manuscript scripts of them. Um, I can't speak to the rareness of them. I, I'm not familiar enough with the literature. Um, what I can speak to is that they're very beautiful. A lot of them, I think, were made for him. There's a couple, and I mentioned this somewhere in the article, there's a couple that are um, clearly by the same hand, which might indicate that they are um, Jones's own um, a scribe of some sort. Um, they tend to be on paper, but I, I mean, it must be quite common, but there's some very long, thin ones. Again, I'm not a scholar of Sanskrit, so please uh, correct me someone if I am completely wrong. There are also, the, there's about two, I think, on bark, but not many. Most are on paper, but it's very long paper. And uh, Jones's manuscript of Quran, uh, RSPA 82, is quite different from the rest of the collection, particularly its paper. Is it the manuscript he was gifted by the King of Anjouan when Jones visited the island on his voyage to India? I don't think it can have been because it was scripted by Haji Abdullah, interestingly enough. Um, he may have had two Qurans, I don't know. The only one that I've seen is the one that's in the, um, in the what's it called, uh, British Library. Um, and that one is script, it's in the same script and style and the same paper, it's in, in, it's in European paper as um, the others by uh, Herji Abdullah. And we have one here from Jake Benson. Is there any evidence that Jones commissioned professional scribes other than Haji Abdullah Madki to copy manuscripts, to copy manuscripts for him? Um, have you found any other references to him as the patron who commissioned um, uh, manuscripts. And um, Jake says, I've read that Nawab Ali Ibrahim Khan Bahadur presented Jones with the Tufat al-Hind that he copied. Yeah, so the Tufat al-Hind is a very important manuscript in the Jones collection. It's um, absolutely covered in notes that Jones made in marginalia, in um, uh, different translations and comments and ideas. It's a really fascinating manuscript and well worth um, someone taking a look at. Um, it, it, and it's also very beautiful. It's got beautiful gold leaf paper all over it. Um, that was given to him by Nawab Ali Ibrahim Khan, 
and uh, is mentioned in his letters where he talks about how he's received this wonderful manuscript from Ali Ibrahim Khan. Um, in terms of other manuscripts that Jones was a patron for, I don't know if this one counts, but um, the manuscript uh, Divan, again, that James White wrote an article on uh, by a Persian poet called Ishq, um, Jones has a, a poem commemorating him in that. As for other scribes, there is one called Ezzedine, who Jones had um, copy and actually is in a very similar way, kind of unknown uh, other than through this, um, like Haji Abdullah, who Jones had copy his Persian manuscripts, these being um, Bustani Khayal and um, a copy of the Shahnameh and a couple of other key texts that Jones wanted pristine copies of. And I have another another question. Are, are you are you all right? <laughs> Just a few more. Um, this is from Lindsay. I agree with Johnny's appraisal of erasure. I wanted to mildly query the inherent colonialism in his approach and suggest in construction colonialism, a continuous act of construction. But my more specific question is about the painting. It is a format incorporated from 16th, 17th century painting into the uh, Isfahani oil painting in the 17th century. Um, I wonder if one could take the portrait in more than one way, a non-classical element in such a portrait in a European context is a highly unusual feature. So one could take this as his partial subversion of the form as well as an appropriation of decontextualization. Maybe actually, Lindsay, you should unmute <laughs> or we unmute you so that you can sort of, because I think it's quite a long question and quite complicated, just for, um, so that Johnny can, can uh, answer it. Hi, yeah, thanks very much, Matty and, and Co, for unmuting me. Sorry, I raised my hand earlier because I thought this is going to be too long to type into. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I love um, your use of the painting and I, I love what you're saying in working through the um, uh, the histories of the manuscripts by and showing the erasures as a kind of material process and I just wanted to think suggest that maybe you could bring the portrait into that really is, is mm. actually more in line with what you're saying about the manuscripts that this is a format of portrait that that actually would be understood it's, it's been knocking around the subcontinent um, if I sort of uh, follow Eleanor Sims and Suzanne Barbayi on this for mm -hmm. 150 years or so yeah. so it's it's it or 100 years so it's a known portrait format and mm -hmm. and uh and it's it's but you I've I've been looking and you can rarely ever see anything that's non-classical uh, or non-European included in those paintings, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, other than other than sort of contemporaries. Uh, you know, in terms of antiquities, there's rarely anything that's non-European. Um, and so I just wanted to say, and maybe you could, you it, it is worth saying something more about that. Like maybe it, you can see it as a partial subversion. I don't know. Is there space in in your? Oh, definitely. I think yeah. that there is so much space, um, which is kind of what I wanted to get at at the end, where I was saying that I wasn't uh, actually really criticizing him, uh, so to speak, but rather just thinking about this as a kind of like normal. Um, or a normal, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, there's so much space within Jones's work to look at him as uh, an open-ended figure in many ways who um, used the materials of study in some in some ways that we, we that I've talked about as erasure, but also did do a huge amount of non-erasure in that, you know, there's so much publishing on various different elements of um, Arabic and Persian literature and, and beyond, uh, such that, uh, yeah, completely, I do agree that there is so much space for it to be uh, a subversion within the mode of portraiture. I mean, I'm not personally an uh, historical person. I don't know the history of that portraiture at all. So it was kind of my own interpretations looking at it immediately, if you know what I mean. But um, no, I really take the point. I think that's a really good point. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have another one, which is quite specific, it's referring to verses on, 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 a, on a very particular manuscript. I don't know, it's RSPA 32, um, where, which the translation is here, O Yunus act justly and virtuously out of love. It's in Persian. And the question is, do you think the handwriting of this 
is William Jones's. I mean, I don't know if you you can immediately bring that to mind or there know, there is. I I actually think I know exactly what this manuscript is, but I'm not sure. Um, I might be wrong. Um, I think it is, if I remember Jones's, I don't have a picture to hand, unfortunately, so I can't go and look immediately. But thank you very much for um, for the for the suggestion. I think it probably is Jones's. He wrote all over poems all over his manuscripts. So yeah, there's there's a high probability. I mean, when you're looking at the marginalia, um, do you feel that you you get to know his processes and how he's, yeah, to the point poem. that you can see a tick being his or a tick being someone else's so it's yeah. I remember just within the first few days of going through these manuscripts seeing such regular types of marginalia and there's so much valuable stuff in there that really um, it warrants so much further study much more than I've been able to give it so far so right um, and we have a, another I think you answered this this is the really the question that I gave to you from Christina, but I'll, I'll read it out anyway. Is it possible to reconstruct how Jones was perceived by the persons he was in contact with, except for the copyists who worked for him? Um, ooh. Well, I think yes, because, well, I mean, I have, you have sort of have to trust, I suppose, the comments he's making. But if he's writing in his notebook all the time that people are willing and um, and very um, keen to go and get manuscripts for him, to go and pick up things for him, or to give him uh, valuable bits of bits of text or whatever, um, and to be in conversation with him. He's got lots and lots of interlocutors who are um, bringing him to meet all sorts of people. He clearly had extremely warm relations with these people, in my opinion. Mm. As yeah, as we talked about earlier. And then there is a request to see the portrait again. I can uh, share my screen again if people would like. And um, oh, I can't find it. That should be working there. There we go. So that should. Right. If anyone wants to to <laughs> make comments on that. And I think, um, Ed, would you like to give your question and, and unmute you uh, for, for, for Johnny? Because I can't, uh, the screen, the, the chat, I'll just see if I can, act. can you hear me, Ed? I, I can hear you, yes. Yes. Or, oh, I've, sorry, it's come up now. Um, well, I'll read it out and then you can add anything you want to it. The idea that contemporary academia venerates people like Jones is completely backwards, it would be infinitely more controversial to mount even a partial defense of Jones's legacy in an academic setting than it would be to pillar, pillory him as a colonizer. Would you like to? Can you, can you hear me? I can, just, uh, just, I can just elaborate slightly on that. I yes, think. I think that would be a good um, So my, my uh, two concerns really, the first is to what extent that the practices that you described Jones was engaging in, which is the editorial aspect of collecting, hmm. to what extent those are specific to this particular context and to what extent those are stand, con standard conventions of collecting um, and not and not just collecting but academic work as well we all as academics produce things over our own name and we all editorialize and create a sense of ourselves or it's a sense of, of, of authorship uh, and of course can we have conventions of modern acknowledgements and references and this sort of thing but i, I think there's there's a there's a strong danger and i, I think temptation to interpret some of these things in a particular direction, which is what I, as I say, my experience of, 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 of academia recently is very much that the temptation is to decry people like Jones and um, to underestimate the, the world historic contribution that Jones and people like Jones made to the modern mm -hmm. humanities, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the fact that it was within deeply imperfect historical circumstances, i.e. the origins of modern imperialism. But this is the first time that we really get this um, transcontinental transmission of cultural heritage as I say, deeply imperfect circumstances with people who are bound up in the colonial enterprise and imperialism, which 
had all kinds of disastrous effects for, for many people. But the it's it's the it's very easy to overlook what there is to be valued in what Jones and his ilk were doing. Um, and if he's not going to be defended at a talk at the Royal Asiatic Society, then, then he never will. So hence, I, that's my... That's my uh, I will um, say on that that I never claim to be doing an offence of Jones in my talk, and I would never say that the Royal Asiatic Society has to be engaged in that kind of talk, although I obviously don't work there. But what I would um, respond to on the conventions of authorship, my main concerns about that, I suppose, stem from the fact that Jones is quite big on um, his citation practice, to I can't think of a better term. He is very big, at, he, he really does a very good job of noting exactly when and exactly how and exactly from who among his friends and acquaintances of a European background gave him and provided manuscripts for him, which is where I first began to notice a sort of disparity between how he was treating um, non-European and European scholars. And I think you're absolutely right that this is a convention of scholarship that perjures uh, per until today and he was working within a certain world, etc. I completely agree with you and I am certainly not devaluing Jones's historical or world historical legacy and I would really not like for that to be seen, partly because um, frankly so much of well, I mean, so much of the history of Arabic literature as a field is dependent on people like Jones, who managed to do the first translations in very complicated epistemological circumstances, which I have mentioned in this talk, including the complete lack of any kind of scholarship, well, not lack of any kind of scholarship, but lack of most scholarship before them. And you're absolutely right. It is so easy for me to sit here and criticise Jones when I have all the world at my feet in terms of scholarship. And I completely agree with that point. But what I am saying is that that's not a reason to necessarily defend every single practice that Jones did or every single treatment of uh, other people. I find the way I find the idea that um, his treatment of Haji Abdullah, for example, who is one of the big names in his in his scholarship, is um, normal. I don't think it is normal. Um, and I don't think that we should shy away from explaining or pointing out, perhaps, colonial epistemologies where we see them, partly because if our scholarship is going to be future facing, which I would like to think that most scholarship is future facing, we have to be careful not to repeat the same logical problems. I mean, really, when it when it comes down to it, I could I could talk about, you know, lots of things to do with Jones, but also lots of other scholarship, my own scholarship, and the way that I disregard loads of people, I'm sure all the time. But it, it's just something that it came to, you know, it's something that I think is worthy of comment, um, that yes, he's participating within a certain epistemological space. But um, he and yes, there's lots of value to be found in his work, but this is also a certain element of his work that we can look at, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I have a, um, a request I, from uh, Roseanne Roche. I don't know if, if she just said she would like to ask a question on my chat. So, um, Ro Roseanne, can you hear me? Can you unmute? If you'd like to ask your question. No, maybe she's, she just put a message that Roseanne would like to ask a question. Anyway. Can you, can you oh, hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. hear you. Please, go ahead. How are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a, a, a nitwit at uh, electronics. Uh, and it's I'm, fine. It's I'm, fine. I'm, 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 I'm retired. I haven't had to, to uh, learn about uh, Zoom much earlier. Uh, here, here is first, uh, uh, thank you for um, uh, uh, insisting on studying the, the use that uh, Jones makes of his manuscripts. But I'm a Sanskritist, so uh, uh, I just would like to ask you if you have tried to track down uh, the, the, the later fate of manuscripts that were sold, sold at uh, 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 the, the, the public sale of, of his library. Uh, I just found recently that Sanskrit manuscripts that I had been searching for for years um, are in St. Petersburg. Uh, they had been acquired by uh, the bookseller Cochrane. Mm. And uh, the person who negotiated the sale was uh, Friedrich Rosen, 
uh, who was professor of Oriental uh, languages at the University of London. Now, uh, uh, Cochrane also bought manuscripts in uh, uh, Persian or Arabic. I'm sorry, I don't know because I don't know how to differentiate those. But um, it is just possible that I only know about Sanskrit manuscripts because the, the, the collection uh, was cataloged in the newspapers of the time. But uh, I, I just wonder whether you might find also some manuscripts there or if you have found some manuscripts there. So um, thank you so much for that uh, point and for coming, actually. Um, I found your articles in the writing of this so in fascinating. Um, so uh, Jones's Sanskrit manuscripts, as I say, unfortunately, I'm not a Sanskritist and I have a bit of a barrier because I, I can't approach the text. So um, I've always had difficulty with the Sanskrit ones for that reason. Um, but yes, so Cochrane, I, I found a problem when I was looking at the texts that were sold at the auction, because as soon as you get to Cochrane, you have to, it's kind of hard to get any further. So it's actually, I'm really glad that you said about the one St. Petersburg, because that clears up a certain manuscript trail, that there are, um, there's a number, and it's mostly Sanskrit actually, that gets sold at the auction, um, which go to various different figures, some of whom I have managed to track down, and there's a couple that are in the Bodleian, there's a couple that are in the John Rylands, but there is not, um, a lot of them are still unknowns to me, which I think would require only a little bit more cur like curatorial work, which I've not actually at the moment had time to do, but um, in the future would look to do. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think we will finish there for, for, for this evening. Johnny, thank you thank very you. much for a really interesting and thought-provoking uh, um, um, talk. I mean, it's another, it's another way that we can sort of understand Jones, another way of understanding his work. And I think it, it's, it's, it's very important, uh, you know, especially when you have access to the, the books as, as, as a group you know, in the library. So it must have been a very interesting project. It was very, very interesting, yeah. yeah. So I hope there'll be more <laughs> on this. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you everybody for attending tonight. And um, yes, that's it. And please stay safe from COVID and stay well. All right, thank you, good night. Thank you.